You can turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to talk today about the power of biblical femininity. Not feminism of the modern world. Feminin femininity, uh, when a woman dresses and looks and carries herself like a lady, according to what the scriptures say. We're going to look at a bunch of uh, scriptures here today on this subject. There are some great women that are mentioned in this book. And uh, we'll pay honor to those women today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. A woman can be a great witness to her husband if she says, I'm going to be in submission to you. Lift the husband up and put him on a pedestal. I'm glad I married a real man. Thank you for providing for me, husband. Lift him up. Make him feel good about himself. Don't tear him down. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, they're watching it. It's talking about lost men married to saved women, by the way, in context there, if you, uh, you know, look at it again there. They can behold what you are doing. They'll watch you. And if you act like a true biblical lady, you'll have power. Verse 3, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. It's not about what you have, your outward appearance. That's not where you get the power of biblical femininity. Where do you get it from? Verse 4, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, Jesus Christ in your heart, in other words, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. A meek and quiet spirit. It doesn't mean... Yes. No. Yes. You know, that's not what it's talking about. If you ever see a really regal woman, she'll sit there, a queen, and they'll say, uh, Queen, this is for you. Thank you. It's kind of an interesting thing. I've seen that. Um, aren't many, you know, there's really nobody royal around today anymore. <laughs> Pretty much gone now. Um, verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to, the, to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Men have a part to play in it, certainly. But you have to understand that women are weaker. And you should want to be. Okay? There's this satanic movement that's lasted for about 100 years now, the transvestite movement, the women's suffrage movement that came in in the early 1900s with the flapper era and everything else, and women started to cut their hair short and they started to put pants on never before in history. Study it. Look into it. Um, I'm telling the truth. Women always wore dresses and skirts. And... The mark of, you know, long hair was a biblical, beautiful thing and whatever else because there's supposed to be distinction between men and women, you see. But women got this whole thing of, I'm just as good as a man. And I can do anything that a man can do. And I can, in fact, I can do, do it better. <laughs> no, you can't. Well, no, I can prove that I can. Why? What's the point? You know, it's really weird. It's, it's sort of uh, saying, you know, um, a... Uh, Beautiful harp. I can hammer a nail into a board with a harp, you know, just the same as I can with a hammer. No, the harp is for a different purpose. Women, the Bible does not put women down. The Bible says this is what a woman is supposed to be. This is how she's supposed to be a lady. And when a woman is in her biblical role, she will have power. And I've seen it. We'll be talking about that in this study. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? It's talking about a physical covering. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? 
It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Feminine looking hair, in other words. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. You don't have to wear a physical covering. It's, now, it's, you can if you want to. It goes on to say, verse 16, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Do what you want in terms of wearing a hair, you know, head covering or whatever else, physical covering or just long hair, whatever. But the whole thing is there, it says, If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. From who? Where's the glory come from? It comes from what men out there in the world perceive. I've seen it many times. My wife has very long, beautiful hair, goes down to her waist in the back. And I've seen sometimes she has her hair done really nicely and whatever else. And um, we'll be walking out someplace and, and she'll have a beautiful dress on. And I have seen older men come up to her, walk up to her and say, excuse me, ma'am, I just wanted to compliment you and just say you look beautiful today. Just out of the blue. And she'll say, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Had a guy come up the one time and he said, you just don't see women in modest apparel anymore. You know, another time I've told this story before, it was really a funny story, but um, there was an older couple and the woman was dressed, you know, very masculine and whatever else. And my wife was going to get into her side of the vehicle. Well, this older man leaves his wife. They're walking towards their vehicle. We're walking towards ours. He runs away from his wife, comes over, opens the door for my wife and says, oh, please let me help. And she gets in and she says, thank you very much. And he, she pulls her dress in and he goes closes the door you know and uh he goes over and he gets in his door you know and his wife has to get in her side you know and uh you know and we're backing out i look over and he's he's sitting there you know just kind of this look of you know whatever and she's just you know glaring at him <laughs> on a whole boy <laughs> you just made your life pretty rough but uh what happened there um my wife had a glory about her that was her long hair. She doesn't want to look like a man, you see. She wants to have distinction. And, you know, if you're a woman out there and you say, well, my hair is short and whatever else, um, you've done that because of most of the time a woman will have her hair cut short because of some fashion style type of a thing. Uh, I realize that there are women that would say, well, you know, my hair falls out. Well, um, then find out what's going on nutritionally and, and whatever else there. But... Uh, you know, we have to remember, we are in the end times. You can't take what's going on right now and say, this is normal right now, therefore I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, no. You have to look at thousands of years of history and say, why is it that women never wore pants? Why is it that women always had long hair? And now just for the last 100 years, that's changed. Hmm. Um, I am not okay with the new normal new normal. Uh, it's wicked. I don't want anything to do with it. I prefer to go back to what the Bible teaches and what historically was there. First Timothy chapter 2. I'll show you another one here about the power of biblical femininity. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Verses 8 through 12. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Very similar to 1 Peter chapter 3 that we read earlier. But again, you see the thing there of modest apparel. And you can get into the thing of, well, sometimes dresses and mini skirts and whatever, you know, tight dresses or mini skirts aren't modest. Well, of course. Well, then you don't have to wear dresses or skirt. That's a stupid argument. All right. When you look at history, the historical context, a nice, long, pretty dress is modest. All right. And, and you get this thing about, what about some certain sports and things like that and whatever else uh, that you know, that a woman would, you know, the, she'd be running or whatever and her dress comes up and wouldn't pants be better in that situation? Well, you have to ask yourself, should a woman be doing certain things? That you have that too. Ladies of the past wouldn't have said, no, I'm not going to crawl underneath the vehicle and change the oil or something. They wouldn't have done that. 
And, you know, of course, you, you know, well, what about my roommate's brother's sister's cousin's, you know, whatever. And she, you know, is single and she, you know, has no choice but to change oil herself or whatever. There's always ways that you can, you know, use the exception to overthrow the rule. But what I'm trying to show you here is historically there wasn't this thing of women trying to wear pants and look like men. It's not there. This is only a recent thing here as we are in the end times, the times when, you know, that make God mad. And, you know, wouldn't it be a great thing if there was actually a biblical lady that was out there and she had a nice long dress on and she said, um, went to the garage and said, um, excuse me, I would like to have my oil changed. Could you please do that? While you're doing that, I want to sit over here and read my Bible. What could God do in that situation? Oh, but we have to think through things our way and whatever else and, and whatever. Yeah. Um, verse 10. But which, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. There should be good works there for a biblical woman. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. You say, well, that's very demeaning. Oh, women can't teach you. They have to be in silence. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. It says here, he that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. You see what's talking about a man? Well, it's talking about mankind there, because it's certainly that's true of a man or a woman. And when you have somebody that's of a good spirit, that's wise, they will keep their mouth shut, and they will learn, and they will sit there. Hmm, you know, very interesting. Uh, my wife, back when we used to go to the Babel building and things, um, or even, you know, nowadays we go around and whatever else, she'll take notes a lot of times. If I get into a conversation or whatever else, she'll take notes. She'll sit there and she'll be quiet and she will listen and she'll remember things. And it's so interesting because there's been many times we'll go and we'll have a conversation with somebody and whatever else and, um, you know, People come up to me in the store and whatever else, and they get into a conversation. Oh, is that your vehicle out there with the stickers? And Yeah, it is. Are you Christian? Yeah, oh well, yeah, I am. You know, I'm in ministry. I do this and I do that. And get to talking to them. And the guy tells me his name and whatever else. And and I say, okay, yeah, it was nice meeting you, John, or whatever. And, and you know, five minutes later, I don't remember the guy's name. <laughs> I just, I'm thinking about, I could have said this, and I probably should have said that, and I, you know, whatever. And. And she says, uh, and I'll say, oh, no, so what was the guy's name again? And my wife, she'll remember his name. She'll remember all these details that I forget. And yet she was being quiet the whole time. Why? Because she's listening. See, the Bible's not putting women down and saying, you're just too stupid to know anything. You're just dumb and shut up. You have nothing good to say. Just talk about recipes and making dresses or whatever. That's not what the Bible's saying in 1 Timothy chapter 2. What the Bible is saying there is a woman should be quiet and take notes mentally. Why? Because ladies have a really good memory. <laughs> Married men, you know, understand that. You know, there are things that get brought up and you say, how did you even remember that? I, I totally forgot about that situation. That's one of the good things about being married. One of the amazing positive benefits of being a married man is you have your wife there to be your memory when you, you know, I don't remember such and such. Honey, what was the name of that guy again? You know, and you'll know that once you get married. She'll be able to remember a lot of things that you can't remember. There's power there, you see. When a woman responds to biblical femininity and she's quiet, she's listening, she's paying attention, she's recording certain details that she pretty much knows that you're going to forget as her husband. It's a good thing. Proverbs chapter 31, the inf infamous Proverbs 31 woman. Let's look into that. Proverbs 31, verse 10, down through the end of the chapter. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Amen. 
The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Let me just stop right there. A good test, if you're a single guy, uh, you take a girl out, do something simple. Like take her for a walk in the park or, or take her canoeing or kayaking or hiking or go out and pick wild edibles or, or do some kind of a simple thing. Let's sit down and, and you know, whatever. Talk about a book or, you know, anything. I don't really know what city people do and, and whatever else. Sorry, I'm from the country, but you say, well, I can't go canoeing or kayaking or I get that. But, you know, go to an art museum or something like that, you know, or whatever. Do something simple. And if she's happy and she says, I've really had a good time, that's a good sign. But if it's, you know, when are you going to take me out to eat? And I wanted to have this and spend all this money on me. You know, uh, you probably want to stay away from her. Um, verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Another thing that you want to look for as a man that's a single man um, look for a woman that can do crafts with her hands. If she can knit, she can crochet, she can do sewing, she can you know cook really well. She's really good at, she has talent. That's another thing that's important. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Watch out for women that uh, sleep till noon or something. You know, that's a problem. You get a woman that sleeps a lot or whatever else, uh, not so good. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. It's perfectly fine for a woman, by the way, to work and to make money if she's doing it from home. All right, that's fine. The problem is when you have a career woman that goes out into the workforce away from her husband and she's out there working with other men and starts bossing them around and whatever else, that's where the problem comes in at. Um, verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Interesting because there's her, you know, all her household are clothed with scarlet. Her clothing is silk and purple. It's funny because the Vatican, the satanic system that it is, Mystery Babylon there, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Revelation 17, they try to copy the virtuous woman and they make their collars purple and scarlet. You know, that it's just kind of, you know, where did they come up with the collars there? It doesn't make any sense. Well, they came up with it by stealing it from the virtuous woman. Excuse me. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. That's another thing, you know. A good woman will help to build her house. The Bible talks about that. She will uh, be a good counselor to her husband. She will be a good mother to her children. She'll, you know, make money. And whatever else, help to make money and help her husband to make the right decisions. And they will prosper. She'll rejoice in time to come. Uh, verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She gets that by being quiet and listening. You know, the old two ears and one mouth. Listen twice as much as you speak. Uh, she looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Um, that's a good woman. Um, could you say that she has power there? She's known. People praise her. Her husband praises her. Um, children love her, they respect her. Yes, but you see, it takes effort. But if you really want to know how to have power as a woman, as a woman, excuse me, uh, how women can have power, it's through being feminine, biblical femininity, 
what does the Bible say I should do? You go through that list there and you say, you know, I could get up a little earlier. I could work a little harder. I could learn some more crafts with my hands. I could learn to be quiet more and listen. Hmm. I could try to think of ways that I can build my husband up so that he's known in the gates. I could try to encourage him. I could try to work a little bit harder with my children. I could spend more time with my son or my daughter or my children or whatever. I'm going to work as hard as I can because I want my family to prosper. I want to be a good woman. Now we're going to look at uh, two different great women of the Bible. Books of the Bible actually written about them. Uh, turn back to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth and Esther. God thought so highly of women that he actually wrote two books of the Bible about godly women. It's really something to think about. Ruth chapter 3. Paging right by it here. You know, I'd, I've heard this thing so many times over the years, you know, that, that there are women, they'll say that, you know, I, I don't want anything to do with God or the Bible or whatever else because it's so demeaning to women and, and things. And it's always confused me. I've never quite understood that because it's, it's uh, you know, there's some really good stuff written about women in the Bible. But people are weird, I guess. Ruth chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. Um, what did Ruth have? She had beauty, but she had the ability to work really hard. She goes in before Boaz here, and it says, uh, Ruth chapter 3, verse 6, And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch that thou, as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And know it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Okay, so he has to go and you read the story there. But the whole point is, understand in the Old Testament that there was a system there where if a man dies, um, you're supposed to, you know, his relatives are supposed to basically take his wife and then they get the inheritance of that family. You don't just say, well... She's a widow, so, well, forget it and whatever. Boaz did the right thing there and came and took Ruth and, you know, married her. And, of course, they had, you know, children. And that was a good thing that he did there. But it was a transaction type of a thing. I'm not saying that there was no love between them. Of course, there was. But he respected her and he said, you know, you're fair to look upon. You're a beautiful woman, but you've also, you're also very virtuous. Um, you could go after a younger man or whatever, and, and, you know, she could have done that, but she wanted to do the right thing. And so she had some power there. Now let's look at the other one, Esther. Uh, Esther 2. And here you have another example of a great woman, and she had power through beauty and strength, spiritual strength. Ruth... She proved herself by being a good worker. She came home with her mother, Naomi, and she was there, and she's out in the fields working. And, you know, Boaz, if you know the story of Ruth, he looks over and he says, you know, who's that? And uh, he takes notice to her, and she's a hard worker, and she's trying to take care of her mother-in-law. She didn't have to do that. And Boaz takes notice, and he says, okay, yeah, you know, hey, there's inheritance there. All right, I'll marry her, and I'll raise up seed to her. Um, and I get the land. It'll be part of my wealth then. 
What about Esther? Esther 2, verse 15 through 18. Now in the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king. She required nothing but what Hegai, Hegai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto king Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. Um, this wicked pervert, he's dead, and I believe probably in hell right now, Tex Mars came out years ago and he said that this story, the whole purpose of the book of Esther was to show how wicked the Jews were. And that Esther came in and she was, you know, wasn't wearing any clothing and she was wicked. And, and he turned it into this perverted, horrible story and it was terrible. Then why on earth, you know, so God had to write a book to tear down the people that he chose? Weird, really weird. Um, no, Esther didn't need to spend months getting ready to come and present herself before the king if she was just going to walk in without anything on. Uh, don't fall for these anti-Jewish people that just hate the Jewish people. I, I just, I can't stand them. Um, they drive me crazy. Uh, no, Esther was a very godly woman. That's why a book of, was written about her. And she comes in there and she's naturally a very beautiful woman. And she doesn't put on all the makeup and all the other stuff and whatever else. And the king looks and says, wow, she's a real lady. Biblical femininity, you see. And it doesn't stop there. She had power. She prayed and she fasted because Haman wanted to kill off all of her people. So she prayed and she fasted. She had spiritual power. Go to chapter 7, Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther the queen. She's setting a trap here. And the king said un, again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther, the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. <laughs> then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. I'm sure he was. You know, and then they hanged him on the gallows that he had designed for Mordecai. And they killed a whole bunch of his people. But uh, the whole point there is Esther... You read uh, earlier here in the book of Esther, she's not supposed to go in before the king. And she comes in and she says, I'm going to pray and fast. Have everybody else do so. I'm going to pray and fast and I'm going to go in before the king. And it's normally death if you do that. But she walks in and the king looks over and he sees her and he says, he holds out the royal scepter and he's, you know, come on, what do you have to say? And she comes over and she says, you know, I'd like to throw a, a feast. And then she throws the feast sets it all up and Haman's there thinking, hey, I'm a hero, I'm a cool guy, I'm in the in crowd and everything else. And she says, um, there's somebody that's conspiring to kill us. King? Who's that? That guy right there, Haman. She had power. And you can have similar power as a biblical woman, a saved woman, a saved sister in the Lord. Uh, you don't have to have power by being equal with men. Um, that's not power. Okay, that's confusion. Uh, there's no power in confusion. Always remember that. God wants women and men to be separate. And you don't have to be some weak little thing that just gets stepped on in your doormat and whatever else. You can gain power. Um, again, using my wife as an example, um, I've seen so many times where we'll be walking into a store and she's a bit ahead of me and whatever else. I'm 
you had to get something out of the vehicle and she'll walk i've seen men of all different kinds um rough looking men older men younger men whatever else and they'll run and they'll grab the door for her and hold it and they won't do it for other women because my wife is dressed like a lady and she has long hair and she carries herself like a lady you say well she was raised you know that way and, and whatever that's just the way she was raised no actually my wife was raised as a tomboy um two branches of the military the whole thing uh, she was not raised to be very feminine um, but since she got saved, the Lord changed her heart, and she always wondered about those things. But now, okay, this stuff makes sense to me, and, and I love wearing dresses, and I love to do this, and I love to do that. Um, there are certain things my wife is not allowed to do. Why? Because it's not ladylike. My wife will never run one of my chainsaws, ever. She doesn't. Um, my wife doesn't work on vehicles. That's my job. Um, 99% of the time I drive, unless I say, hey, can you help pull this vehicle over here or whatever else or something, I drive because I want her to be a lady. I want there to be a difference with my wife. Um, so uh, if you're new to Bible-believing Christianity, please understand what the Bible teaches about women, uh, why there's supposed to be a difference there, and that you can have power in doing things God's way, according to God's word. You live according to this book right here. God won't let you down. I mean, put this book to the test. Try it out. The Bible says, dress, your, dress in modest apparel. Dress in modest apparel. You're supposed to have chaste conversation mingled with fear. Um, meek and quiet spirit. You're not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Try it. Try it. Go through Proverbs 31 and say, I'd like to get up earlier. I'd like to work harder with my hands. I'd like to be better to my husband, to my children, to whoever. Try them out. See how it works. So hopefully this has been a challenge to the women out there. And um, to you men out there, I just want to say one thing, and that is if you are forcing your wife to do masculine things and you're telling her that you don't want her to dress, have dresses on and cut your hair short and whatever else, then shame on you. Um, I'm probably, probably going to be doing a sermon in the future on the thing of why men try to act their, make their wives act masculine. And I'll just spoil it. I know why they do. It's because they're boys. They're not real men. Um, they don't want to have to handle a real, true lady. They want to be a little boy and say, oh, my wife, I can pull her into all these things and make her do masculine things and whatever else. Um, it's not supposed to be that way. God wants distinction. So, um, that is going to be that. And, uh, be doing some bigger studies coming up here. Uh, so please do keep us in your prayers. It's rather hot in here right now. If you've been noticing, I've been going like this a lot and like that, trying to keep the sweat from getting into my eyes. It's rather hot right now in Northern Maine. Um, you're probably going to laugh if you're from the south. It's uh, in the 80s here. Uh, to me, that's hot. That's very hot. <laughs> it's getting up into the higher 80s, up towards 90 degrees, and that's just, I can barely handle that. Um, I can't really sleep much above 75 degrees. It's, it's just not very good. So <laughs> I know people down south or wherever else that you are, if you're in a warmer area, you're probably laughing right now and saying, no, oh, Brother Brian, you don't have a clue how hot it gets down here. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's why I'm up here. Um, so hopefully I've made sense with the study. I'm sorry if I've been a little bit off. Not been, I haven't been sleeping very well um, when it's in the 80s at night and it doesn't cool down. And there's, you know, um, being off grid, I can't have air conditioning blasting or something like that. So um, been a rough few weeks here, whatever, since it's been pretty hot. But... Like I said, hopefully I've made sense of it. But um, if you're a lady, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of who you are, of what the Bible says. And um, if you say, well, I haven't really tried that, uh, Brother Brian. I've, I've got shorter hair and I, have, I wear pants a lot and whatever else. Okay, then uh, start putting dresses on. Um, start to look like a lady and act like a lady. Act feminine. Live according to the scriptures and watch the power of God displayed in your heart or in your life 
Uh, remember the Bible said in First uh, Peter chapter 3 about let it be the hidden man of the heart, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. You can show the power, the hidden man of the heart. Jesus Christ can shine through you as a lady, a Christian lady, a very proper lady. I've seen it with my own wife. I've seen her um, as an experiment now for all of these years. I remember um, one time we were in a, a grocery store in Olean, New York. And um, there was a woman and uh, dressed very much like a man and whatever else. But uh, she she uh, was going, I, she, we were in the produce area. And I think she picked up, it was either an apple or a pomegranate. I forget which one. But she picked it up and it, and it, another one rolled and rolled down onto the floor. And she went to bend down to get it. And she said, oh, and she used the S word. And she bent down, she picked it up, and she looked up, and my wife and I were coming around the corner, and she said, I mean, shoot. <laughs> she corrected herself. And we didn't say anything. You know, we were just minding our own business. But that woman corrected herself because there was a lady present. Kind of interesting that a woman would correct herself when a lady was present. There's power in this book. That's why the devil's tried to replace it for the last 400 years, over 400 years. There's something to this book. That's why the vast majority of people don't believe in this. They hate this book because this book condemns them. They understand that there's something here that's not like other books. Stand by the King James Bible, brethren. We'll see you in the next study. Thank you for watching.